Chapter 10 None of the locals go paddling. Snap. The black sheet was gone as quickly as it had arrived, my thoughts reverting back to fitness and the task at hand. Changi Nick wasn't an option. What a foolish thought to even consider it, I told myself. Never mind the death sentence, the caning sessions would be worse. They were now being held twice a week to deal with the increase in volume. I recalled reading an article in the Telegraph which contained a quote from a former screw, something along the lines of, they're flogging more and more these days. Before they were doing maybe 60 on Tuesdays and Fridays, now they're doing 100 minimum. It sounded trivial at the time, but not now. On a positive note, my physical strength and lung capacity were in prime condition. Though if I was honest with myself, I wasn't totally convinced I was fit enough to make it across the straits, which by my reckoning was about the same level of fitness required to fight flat out for eight rounds, or thereabouts. It was shit or bust. If I didn't make it, I'd pack it in, sink to the ocean floor and reside with the urchins among the reefs. I prayed no one would attempt to rescue me and drag me ashore to face the music. My wandering thoughts subsided. I needed to get a move on. It wouldn't be long before darkness came down and the bats would be flitting and darting amongst the trees again in the same way they had done in the hotel grounds. More legitimate residents than me, as it turned out. By my reckoning, it had taken me about an hour to clear the straits at a half-decent pace, and with the weather conditions still on my side, it was well within my normal capabilities. I'd been circuit training in the nick and in the run-up to fights for years, and had an acute knowledge of my performance abilities at any given time. Whether in camp for a fight or not, my fuel gauge had always been accurate. I'd never allow myself to be clocked like those old bangers they passed off down Waldorf Way. I'd read that the Johor Strait was once the location of two Victoria Cross deeds. Lieutenant Ian Edward Fraser and acting seaman James Joseph McGuinness sank a Japanese cruiser during World War II. I gave them both a quick nod for their efforts before setting off. I reckoned I too deserved that cross for what I was about to undertake. It was easy to sink a ship from half a mile away with a great cannon, but would those lads have been able to swim it? I doubt it. But honours like those are rarely bestowed upon rowdy old cons like me. I took one last inhalation of the singer air, savouring a final moment to assess my situation before wading in with the enthusiasm of a triathlon contestant on the swimming section. As I waded in, the water got steadily deeper. Wading was for Jessie's. I needed it deep enough to get my legs away from the floor and allow me to use my gorilla-like strength to propel me the 1,200 metres or so over to the beaches of Johor Bahru. My cumbersome physique made wading a positive chore. The sand-like weight shackled around my ankles, reducing me to near slow motion. I'd swam further in training for the second Malpass fight down at the Rye Reservoir. The Wakefield Express photographer who happened to be passing at the time would stand testament to that. I was more than capable. I'd arrived at high tide. The water was calm, warm and kind of brown looking. There were one or two boats in the waters, but they were all some distance away, including the ferry that travelled almost hourly from Johor to Batam and back. It could be very dangerous if I ended up in its path. I'd have to watch out for that as well as the fucking sharks. No paddling, the crudely constructed warning sign had stressed, and it wasn't there to highlight the dangers of the sacred art of paddling itself, I was sure of that. After about a hundred yards the water reached my chest, and I could finally get my legs completely away from the floor. It was a positive joy to be able to make some effective progress. The loss of the floor would have scared most avid swimmers to death in unknown waters like these, but it hadn't me. It had been exactly what I was searching for. Now in the autumn of my physical powers, I broke straight into my trademark front crawl. I knew it had zapped my energy, but I wanted to make some serious progress before even considering any long-term plan for making it all the way across. I was really shifting now. 
I never pissed about. I knew the techniques and how to implement them. Hydrodynamics, how you conditioned yourself so that you could save enough in the tank to make the distance. I didn't want to get stranded and have to cry for help. I needed to get the fuck out of there, not get rescued and slung back in the nick. What were the locals complaining about? This was a joy. Near tepid waters. Not like the ones I'd swam in, in the River Wye on my trip to Wales with old Baldy Norm. Those had been icy cold, exhilarating, wonderful. This was a lukewarm chore, though the reasons for my being here made it equally exhilarating for entirely different reasons. The water was pretty dirty, filthy in fact, and full of debris that occasionally grazed my person or clawed at my retina. On the odd occasion the timing of my squint had been off. I maintained the crawl for another good 400 yards. I was right. My fitness was still on point and I was motoring towards the land on the horizon with the conviction I'd lacked in the past few days holed up in that cell. My thighs were pumped. I was breathing deeply and feeling like an Olympic swimmer until accidentally I left my legs low enough that they touched the seabed. I felt cheated. But the shallow section didn't last long and I was off at pace once again. With a mixture of short, intense bursts of effort and a steady breaststroke, I was nearing the halfway point. Any kind of training I loved, but long swims, boring long swims, weren't my preference. Swimming needed an efficient heart and lungs, and the power I grafted hard for left me heaving and gasping in acts of maintained stamina more often than not. There's more rubbish written about getting fit than any other subject. I should know because I'm an expert, a veritable expert and nobody could tell me anything that I hadn't already tried and analysed using myself as the guinea pig. The most important aspect of the job is getting fit for a purpose and I hadn't seen this one coming, so the job was becoming a bit of a struggle, but one still well within my capabilities. I'd paid off my oxygen debt and was thoroughly warmed up now. My legs were heavy and my calves were tight, but I expected no less. My internal compass was as good as any you'd find down the army stores on Westgate in town. I knew if I veered off track the swim would take twice as long and I might never make it. I used the sun as my guide, monitoring its position in relation to the beach now on the horizon. If it veered too far west I knew I was going off course and making slow progress. If it disappeared off the edge of the earth then I was a goner. The nighttime chill would see sure to it that I was dead before sunrise. There was a red boy ducking and bobbing just a few yards in front of me. I'd been concentrating so hard on the task at hand I hadn't noticed it until it was virtually in my mouth. It appeared to mark the halfway point, where the border of Singapore and Malaysia would be if the straits were dry land. I swam towards it. I was hesitant but I couldn't work out why. I wouldn't dare pass that boy but I couldn't for the life of me work out why. Then it dawned on me. Once I crossed it, there was no going back. I'd evaded the country and the authorities of Singapore and was fair game to be shot as an alien invader in Malayan territory. The irrational thoughts must have been induced by the sun. That combined with the toxic salts created by the pollution entering my system. I was becoming delirious with dehydration and my vision began to blur. A moment later a large boat appeared dead in my path. One of the crew members on deck attempted to say something to me over the tannoy, but only unintelligible crackling noises came out. As the boat drifted closer to me, its size loomed over me in an act of intimidation. The feelings of fear were being magnified by the loneliness of the choppy waters generated by the vessel. Where are you from? One of the crew members hollered as if they were speaking through tubes, long tubes which distorted the voices. Wakefield, where'd you fucking think? I hollered back. My defiance never wavered. It was then I realised. It was a mirage. The boat, its crew, the waves, had simply been contained within my mind. Any onlooker would have been genuinely puzzled by my behaviour. Suddenly I couldn't breathe. The air wouldn't go in. There was a rough brick wall across my windpipe. I'd accidentally swallowed a load of that filthy seawater and it had polluted my system momentarily 
like diesel thrown in a petrol engine. I jipped and spluttered for a second or two and regained my composure. I was engulfed under its mantle. Time had no meaning, and then snap, I came to my senses. The illusions had all vanished. Without even thinking or attempting to change my train of thought, I'd passed the boy. The oxygen debt sharpened me up. There was no bot or conversation with its crew. My mind had been playing tricks. I gave my head a harsh tap to bring back my faculties and very real surroundings. I was the next country's problem now. There'd surely been hordes of police on the shore behind me praying I made it past that point. Shortly after passing it, I felt I'd hit a gradient. It was long and steep, just like the hill up to the Lupsit Hotel. Of course, that wasn't possible. Slowing momentarily, my body was slowing, telling me I was now into my glycogen reserves, and it was time to self-preserve. I knew there'd been the odd mention of shark attacks on those straits. They were inhabited by a few breeds of shark, including bull sharks. Not shark infested, but none of the locals went paddling. Fucking pollution, I thought with disgust. My rising panic nipped in the bud. I relaxed for a moment, giving the sphincter muscles in my trachea time to adjust. I was so attuned to clean living they'd contracted in revolt. Treading water, lost in my body's control rooms, pulse, respiration, energy levels, the readout said I wasn't properly warmed up. The stokers in my engine rooms were only just coming awake, but working like mad to make up for lost time. I needed to take it nice and steady for the next few hundred yards, or I'd be shark bait before sunset. Due to land reclamation projects on both sides of the causeway, the habitats of some of its inhabitants had become endangered. The food source of dugongs, and no doubt the fucking sharks, which are native to the strait, disturbed. They'd welcome the chance to gnaw on a lump like old Sykesy. None of the locals went paddling? What did that mean, and what did it matter? If a trout had come and slapped one of these little nips around the face that had fallen over. I was different. At six foot three and two hundred weight, even a baby whale was feeling what my right hand had to offer. I'd heard those little fuckers could smell a drop of blood from a mile off. I'd seen the films, Jaws 1 and the rest, how they condition them, the orchestra, the haunting soundtrack. Did it, did it, bum 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 bum. It wouldn't be my blood they'd smell. I fucking reeked at this point. The dehydration had meant only the vilest of vapours were now escaping from my being and crystallising in the beating sun. They'd steer clear if they had any sense. <laughs>